out there. And welcome to the Globe Docs discussion of nine to five, the story of a movement. A look at the nationwide effort started by a group of Boston clerical workers in the early 70s to secure more rights and respect for women in the workplace. The movement inspired the 1980 hit movie of the same name and the super catchy theme song by Dolly Parton. But the movement itself has long been in the shadows. I'm Katie Johnston. I write about work and income inequality for the Boston Globe. And I'm honored to be here with one of the nine to five filmmakers, as well as two of the movement's founders. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Julia, you want to start? Sure. Uh, am I on? You are. Great. OK, so I'm Julia Reichert. I'm calling in from Yellow Springs, Ohio. And I'm the co-director of 9 to 5, The Story of a Movement. And I'm very proud of it. It was many years in the making, wonderful years. And I am actually wearing a 9 to 5 t-shirt. See, raises, not roses. This is the original design that was made back in the mid 70s. So that's me. Hi, right, Janet. Um, I'm Janet Seltzer. I still live here in Boston. Um, and uh, in 1973, when 95 first started, um, I had just finished getting fired from a clerical job for starting a petition <laughs> of my coworkers and wound my way to 9 to 5. And that was my beginning with it. That's great. Uh, and I'm Karen Nussbaum. I'm, I uh, was living in Boston and working as a clerical worker in the early 70s and got together with my friends. We started 9 to 5. I then spent 50 years in the labor movement in one way or another, the last 20 with an organization called Working America, which in a lot of ways is like 9 to 5, but with men. And I've been living in Washington for the last mm, 25, 26 years. Great. Karen, I love, if I could just throw in, I love that Karen used the 50 years, because I've been 50 years making films, largely about women and labor. And I've known Karen for most of those 50 years off and on. You know, um, I think we should really celebrate your making this film, Julia, because it started right here in Boston, and here we are with a, a yeah. premiere. Um, Absolutely. So. Julia, can you can you start us off by um, talking about what drew you and Steve to the nine to five story and why you wanted to tell it now? Well, I've been interested in social movements and how people, when they band together, can actually create change in society. I mean, I think a lot of times people think they're sort of alone and the best way to do things is as an individual, you know, the American ideal of you know, the, the individual and the cowboy and all that. But we know, uh, I believe, that change really happens when people get together. So I had already made Union Maids, which is a story of women organizing for the CIO, the original massive labor movement. And I'd already made Seeing Red, which is a social movement of socialist communist folks. So I was already very interested in making films about history and sort of digging up America's, you know, social movement history for people to see now. So 9 to 5 was sort of irresistible to me because it's my era. I mean, I'm the same age as most of those folks. Uh, and because I feel it was a very important movement that has really been lost to the sands of time. Mm -hmm. You know, as we say early in the film, nobody asks these women about 9 to 5 anymore. And they also banded together with a little bit different principles than a lot of the labor movement, which we can talk more about. In fact, Karen and Janet can talk about it better than I. But they used different tactics. They found their own way with the, the constituents, with the people they wanted, they believed could join together, right? They formed their own way of thinking and organizing, which I found just so inspiring. One thing I loved in the movie, and you just briefly um, touched on it, but I'd love it if you asked, uh, talked a little bit more about it. There was a dartboard with balloons on it, I think, that you had people 
throw at like bad things about their workplace or something. And I found that that's such an engaging way to, to reach people. We uh, put fun into almost everything that we did. We made up songs, we did little plays, we made funny names for our bosses. We, uh, <laughs> uh, we, we would, uh, uh, it was really an important part of a way to bring people in because our object was to get people who otherwise would not get anywhere close to a political organization. Uh, and so we had to make it as inviting um, and and fun for ourselves too. It was always a really important part of our approach. Yeah, I feel like fun and the labor movement don't often go together. So <laughs> that's a, a nice touch. That didn't go together with the labor movement. <laughs> One contribution we made was to bring in a lot of tactics that uh, I think I've seen carried out more today. You know, on the humor front, I think, you know, just as a way of helping women overcome their fear of organizing to be able to make fun of the boss is not a, not a bad approach. <laughs> do you, what, you talked about funny nicknames, Karen. Do you remember any of them that you gave people? I remember a, um, uh, we did a, uh, it, may, it may not have been named so much, but I remember a song about, or a skit about big yellow publishing company and how the women were all going to go up and confront them. We did a, um, uh, a picket line at an employer called Educators Publishing Service, where we were organizing the, the uh, workers there. And our signs read, every person a slave. And we didn't actually know that that was libel. And I got, you know, uh, uh, sued for it afterwards, but it didn't stop us. We, we kept on going. And uh, I remember uh, going in front of insurance companies. We were in front of, I think it was Liberty Mutual, and we had a picture of the CEO of Liberty Mutual with a, um, a Sherlock Holmes figure and a, um, a magnifying glass around the picture of the CEO. And the, and the headline of the leaflet was investigation, because we were bringing in the feds to investigate Liberty Mutual. So it was a way of um, of bringing that straight into every way that we talk to people. On the back of Julia's shirt is another picture, and it's a picture of a stick of dynamite coming out of a high heel. Um, <laughs> and I remember it fondly because I remember I drew it, and it was for our insurance company hearing where we were going to uh, reveal all of our findings about how terrible the insurance companies were, and, and the legend on the leaflet was, women and insurance, an explosive situation. Uh, so that it was a way to say, you know what, if you have the least bit of interest, come on in. It wasn't ever a, you know, working women of the world unite to struggle. That wasn't our approach. Yeah. Well, I wonder then, I was going to ask you how you felt about um, the, the Hollywood movie, Nine to Five, being a comedy that a lot of people didn't connect with the real movement at all. And, and how you felt about that. I mean, clearly you like to use humor, so, so maybe you related to that. How, how did you react to that? I, I think it, it was wonderful. As Jane Fonda says in Julia's movie, there wasn't any example in there that she hadn't been told by some of our members. So as far-fetched as some of the situations may seem, they were right out of the mouth. She spent quite a bit of time uh, interviewing our members around the country. And uh, I think that the humor, again, uh, was a good way to highlight what are really serious situations. And she gets the seriousness across because the issues that are brought up in there, like training somebody younger than you and less qualified to be your boss, um, not having a job description, uh, issues about daycare um, and age discrimination, all those things were in the movie. Yeah, and do you think that it did help raise awareness of what was actually going on? I mean, do you think the non-secretaries in the audience got that this was real, uh, this is actually happening? It was not only that, but um, at that time, my job in 9 to 5 was, was with our national staff, and it was to oversee our chapters around the country. We had about 18 of them. And Jane had given uh, 
us the premiere of that movie as a fundraiser in each of those cities and also <laughs> did these brown <laughs> lunches for women office workers where she would speak in public um, at lunchtime and we would invite all the office workers in the city basically to come and hear Jane Fonda and really like a thousand working women would show up. So it absolutely helped broadcast what we were doing. That's great. Um, I love the part in the movie where the Hollywood um, movie makers come to talk to 9 to 5 and they ask them, uh, the women, if they've had fantasies about killing their boss. And apparently they all had, and they were gruesome. Like the one in the movie they talk about with the woman in the, um, would fantasize about putting her boss in the coffee grinder. Uh, <laughs> I just wondered if any of you, you too, Julia, ever had uh, fantasies about killing your boss and if you would share them. Did you, Julia, ever have a fantasy about killing your boss? Did you ever have a boss? Maybe you've always been your own boss. No. Oh. Well, I'm, I've been a more or less independent filmmaker since I was in my early 20s. Yeah. So except for being a waitress to earn enough money to get my first film out of the lab, I have not had a boss. So, no, I can't answer that one. <laughs> but I, I learned so much about what, how these women were treated. I mean, the ass pinching and the calling them girl and the, uh, the fact that you, you could just grab people at any point. Uh, the rapes that occurred, like which really did occur, and the sexual, the strong sexual harassment, I could totally understand why they'd want to kill their boss. <laughs> it was really, really, really hard back then, back then. I can't imagine. I hope you can hear me. You're breaking up a little bit, um, but I heard you. Karen or Janet, do, do you guys have any boss killing fantasies you'd like to share? No, I, I mean, I've been lucky enough to be an organizer my whole life. And so that was, except for when I was a clerical and uh, at, at the beginning time. And um, so I, I was more on the sidelines, uh, wowed by the stories we heard. Um, uh, and some that, that women harbored for decades. Uh, when the, uh, at nine to five, we had a job problems hotline uh, for years and years. And when Anita Hill um, testified against Clarence Thomas in 1991, this is some years after the period of the time of the, that the film takes place, um, the hotline was ringing off the hook. You know, the, we were getting hundreds of calls. Uh, and one call was a woman who said, I don't know, uh, and this is 91, I don't know if it's too late for me to register a complaint about something that happened to me a while ago. And the hotline uh, counselor said, well, uh, when did it happen? And she said, 1954. And I think about a woman holding on to that shame and anger for all that time. And that was true for a lot of people. You needed an organ the support um, and the, the knowledge that an organization brings to finally find uh, an outlet, a productive outlet for your problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't have uh, much of a fantasy. I was an office worker for about five years, um, probably nine to five. Um, I will say that it is interesting to me that Karen, Ellen, and myself all worked for Harvard. Mm -hmm. To tweak them for a moment, I think they have a very good track record of uh, developing organizers out of their <laughs> employees. <laughs> that turned out to be proof because they um, have continued to organize ever since. But people did, um, short of you know, fantasizing about killing their boss, uh, all kinds of uh, small acts of rebellion. And as Karen's saying, it needed an organization to bring together uh, for some kind of collective action. I remember we had have, we have one member that uh, on her floor organized all her fellow employees, office workers, to wear striped shirts to work, uh, symbolizing that they felt like they were in jail. <laughs> you know, uh, small but little steps of courage and I think um, the other thing that was great about 95 is that I, we were able to really frighten bosses 
in Boston and also around the country um, because we didn't just come out and say, you know, we want this, we want this, we want this at your company. We had inside information. Um, as the movie shows, we had a lot of um, recruitment lunches with women office workers and they would tell us things that were going on on their floor in their department. And we would, without revealing which department or who they were, put those things on leaflets or in our newsletters mm -hmm. as examples. Um, and then when we would go to demonstrate outside of, uh, you know, Bank of Boston or whatever it might be, um, other women who didn't work at that com company could come and demonstrate. But with <laughs> a lot of those women looking out the window of their company and sort of silently cheering us on. Right, right. Well, I was struck by all of the, um, the obstacles that, that you guys and clerical workers faced back then. You know, they were treated like servants, as people said, you know, expected to fetch coffee. The one woman talked about sewing her boss's pants. I mean, all the sexual harassment, which didn't even have a name back then, which is just blows my mind. And, and then you go to the union bosses for help and they're sexist too. Uh, you know, and then there was the backlash in the 80s against feminism. And you've come, we've come so far, and yet we still have the gender wage gap. You know, the Me Too movement showed how much sexual harassment is still out there. You know, women are dropping out of the labor force right and left now because they're still the primary caregivers for their kids who can't go to school during the pandemic. Um, I just, I found the movie so inspiring and, and also disheartening <laughs> at the same time, which I guess is maybe the point. Julia, I don't know. I, I wonder how you all feel about the progress that we've made and haven't made. Julia, why don't you give uh, your perspective? Well, unfortunately, I can't hear. So I'm having, we're having a lot of technical problems here. So unfortunately, we're trying to struggle with it, but I couldn't hear what the question was. Well, uh, let me try again. I just wanted to know what you think about the, the progress that we've made since the 70s as far as women's rights in the workplace and what and the progress we haven't made. I was saying I found your film both inspiring and disheartening, which I thought was maybe how it was supposed to be, but I wanted your thoughts. You catch that? Well, to me, um, I can, in speaking in really broad terms, and don't forget, I also made two films about a factory situation in Dayton, which is also the workplace. I mean, I think the possibilities, the status, the pay, the security of American workers, and I'm talking about workers in general, people who deliver our packages, people who do work in call centers, people who do office work, factory workers who are non-union, non-union, have gone down they've been pushed down gradually over the years. And I think that's kind of undeniable that the wage gap has gotten ridiculous, that the pay gap has gotten ridiculous. And the average working class person, woman or man, immigrant or non-immigrant, does not earn really enough to live on, to have a middle-class life. You, know, you have a house, you have security, you can buy a car. I think that's gone out the window. And I've seen that with American Factory and The Last Truck, which were both set in my hometown of Dayton, Ohio. And I think we're really losing hold of the American dream of having a secure life. I mean, I grew up in a union family. We didn't have books in the house. We didn't have pictures in the house. Uh, there was nobody I knew who went to college. But we owned our home. We were not afraid of getting the heat turned off. Uh, you know, there were not bill collectors. My dad was a union man. We got a vacation. He knew what he was going to get. That, and that was like a third or more of the workforce back then. I mean, that's, that's gone. And I think Karen could really back me up on this, that if you ask about the workplace, I think in general it's gotten less safe and certainly less secure. No, I completely agree with Julia. And I'd also say that, you know, it's not like things only get better in life or in social movements. I, me personally, I don't believe that the arc of history bends towards justice. Not all by itself, it doesn't. And 
social movements have successes and failures. There's a way in which the period that we're in right now is very eerily like the early 70s, and I wouldn't have thought it except if it hadn't been for Julia's film, uh, because it's really allowed me an opportunity to think more about that time. But if you remember in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, the, the world was on fire. The US was waging war in Vietnam. Uh, it was very unpopular. It was uh, American imperialism at its uh, ugliest. Um, there was uh, assassination of African-American leaders, particularly uh, the police killing Black Panthers all over the country. There was, so there was race war. There was um, you know, imperialist war. It was a dark period, but at the same time, you had these emerging social movements, the women's movement, the civil rights movement, the gay movement. Uh, all of that's happening around the same time. And what we did at 9 to 5 is we went into the workplace and while we may have been worried about all those other things, we didn't take that into our new organizing. We said, we're going to find people who aren't with us yet. We're going to find language that's open to everybody. We're not going to have a litmus test about who can join and who can't because they've got, they, they use the right words or they've got the right ideas. Instead, we're going to find common ground. And it's common ground on women need to, uh, be treated fairly, there needs to be equality, uh, and we're going to demand that from the boss. And we brought that kind of openness um, uh, and we built a mass movement. Well, that's kind of awesome. And I think that in some ways that's uh, similar to the period we're in today. This is a much more dangerous period, although we wouldn't have believed it then. Um, uh, but at the same time that we feel overwhelmed by how bad things are politically, we've got these emerging social movements that are thrilling. And how do we then turn that into an opportunity to be broad, not narrow? Yeah, I agree. And I think that um, you really have to take a long view of this kind of thing that, um, you know, any kind of social change is a combination of conditions out there that are beyond your control and the organizing that you know turns them into uh, issues that people can really come together around and um, so what you do in any particular period may not, you know probably never finishes the struggle I, I remember seeing uh, union maids when I was at nine to five when it came out in the 70s and it was so inspiring to me and I Julia, I realize the women that you interviewed are probably about <laughs> our age now. They, they're but, younger than we are, Janet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, but I, I think we were very conscious of building on and sort of uh, standing on the shoulders of earlier organizers. And um, I, I like to think that we're seeing some kinds of activism that uh, Harken back to what we were doing in 95, um, whether it's teachers organizing or uh, fast food workers or uh, home health care providers. Um, these folks are organizing. There's a huge, unfortunately, it's grown unorganized workforce out there. So although, you know, there are dangerous times and this one is one of them and there's a lot of repression, you know, I think as long as there's unequal treatment, um, you're not going to stop the fight that people have to change conditions. It just takes a long time. Right. Well, I mean, did could you I, guys... Could I just add... It was, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I wanted to just underline something that Karen said a minute ago that I did hear, which is the idea that to form a movement that's going to get somewhere you don't have a litmus test. You don't have exact language that you have to use in order to gain entry to that movement. We have to form like broad coalitions and we have to be more inclusive. And that's how we're going to get ahead. We also need structure that will last, which is something that they also built to the best of their ability. Chapter structure, leadership structure, um, 
It was not anarchism at all, nine to five. It was actually carefully built. So I just wanted to emphasize that I learned that from them as well. Um, Julie, I'm seeing a, a, a question I think is from you, and I'm not exactly sure, but it's something about um, how John Hancock relates to nine to five. Oh, yeah. Want to talk about? The reason I brought that up is that Janet, Janet Seltzer, just before we started this call, told me a funny story about John Hancock, which I think is one of the characteristic buildings of downtown Boston. I don't know, I'm not from there. But I thought it was kind of a fun story. That's why I brought it up. Everybody, uh, Janet, Janet, yeah. Everybody knows John Hancock as the John Hancock building, even though it has another name now. But uh, the new John Hancock, which is how we described it in the 70s, was just being built. And it kind of uh, looms over Copley Square in a way that changed the character of that area. And they built it, you know, as everybody in Boston does know, out of glass. And when we started nine to five or soon after, the windows started popping out of the building and shattering on the street below. And on the street below was the tiny little YWCA where our office was. Yeah. And um, I, I told Julia that we really, you know, felt like we were on the front lines of battle with these shattering <laughs> windows coming off of a corporation that we were trying to organize. And I remember um, going out one day after a crash had happened and getting a little piece of glass, you know, say about this big, and um, I still have it. I saved it ever since because it was sort of like the empire crumbling. <laughs> that's so symbolic, almost also the glass ceiling reference too, right? <laughs> like, uh, that's very fitting. Yeah. Um, so if, if people in the audience have questions, you can use that little Q&A function at the bottom to submit them and we will try and um, go through them. Um, in the meantime, I wanted to, um, Jen and Karen had both relayed some, um, some fun stories about the filming of, uh, of the Hollywood movie, Nine to Five. Um, Janet, I think you were on the you were on the set when they first recorded this the song, or or Phil, I still don't have that straight. But you tell us. It's it's one of those stories that uh, is lore, I guess. Which is that if anybody can check its truth, they can try. <laughs> but um, at the time it was being made um, as part of my job, I would travel around to different chapters of Nine to Five, and I went to the Los Angeles nine to five chapter and we meaning some of the staff people were invited on the set of the nine to five movie and we were you know warmly greeted by the three women stars uh unfortunately Dabney Coleman wasn't there the the male boss and um they and I think it was Dolly Parton said I think we should sing that song and so uh myself and several other people were on this little stage and we all sang the nine to five song. And as I mentioned to you before, I like to think that it was that recording that became so popular. Although I kind of- <laughs> That's pretty great. You have to sing with Dolly Parton. I mean, come on, that's awesome. Um, and Karen, you said you, um, you were on the last day of filming. Uh, it was National Secretary's Day in Los Angeles and something interesting happened. Yeah, so uh, we turned National Secretary's Day, which had been created in the 1950s as a, a way that you could, um, bosses would uh, uh, honor their secretaries by bringing them flowers. They wouldn't give them a raise, they wouldn't, you know, didn't have rights on the job, but you could get flowers. And so we turned that into a day of protest and every year we would have a big event on National Secretary's Day. That year, uh, I went to Los Angeles and it turned out it was the last day of the filming of the nine to five movie. Jane came off the set for our noontime event. There were 2000 women packed into the Biltmore Hotel and Jane, you know, just wows them. And the excitement was electric. It was so thrilling. And people stayed for two hours and they didn't go back to their offices. Finally, we had to call it, uh, bring an end to the event. 
And I go back to the office and an hour later, one of the members comes and she said, well, I got back to the office and I was so excited and I was telling everybody around the water cooler what had happened. And then my boss is looking at me like, what am I doing? And then he calls me into his office and I go into his office and he starts telling me that I shouldn't be wasting people's time. And I said, she's telling us this to us at the staff. She's now left the office to tell us this. She said, don't you ever talk to me that way again. I have the, I have the right to talk to my coworkers whenever I feel like it. And I could just imagine 2,000 women going back to their offices and having these right. outbursts all over the city. And that was the kind of thing that happened um, over and over. People would get excited about finding this new powerful part of themselves uh, and then uh, expressing it uh, on the job, in their homes, in their communities. Uh, it really changed women forever. Sure. Well, people often don't realize that their experience is so collective, right? And when you're not alone, when you know you're not alone, it gives you this power to speak out, you know? Um, I mean, how does it feel for you guys, Janet and Karen, to, to have your moment in the sun, you know, that you've, it's been nearly five decades since this movement started and so many people, they know the movie, they know the Hollywood movie, but they don't realize that all the work you did that behind it and that, you know, that, that helped women so much. Um, I don't know, it must, is it, how does it feel to, to, to get a little recognition finally? <laughs> well, um, I'm glad the organization and the movement is getting recognition because um, I think it's important that we know our history and, you know, sort of a la Howard Zinn, the people's history, and this is certainly part of that. Um, and, you know, I think that's the main important thing about this movie being out. Um, yeah, I'd agree with Janet. We're, we're, we've both been really lucky. We've been organizers our whole lives. Um, and so, you know, we did our best then and we've done our best ever since. And that's the reward that we get. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, there's a question from the, uh, someone in the audience um, wanting to know if there was in any interaction with um, now or the ACLU, I guess where um, RBG was in the 70s? Did you guys work with those organizations? You know, not much. Um, we, uh, we probably did some things with now, but we were really, we had a different uh, membership. Um, and so we really were uh, culturally different. We had a different focus. We we're more on the workplace and uh, and while we, ser we saw ourselves building out the women's movement into uh, the working class. Uh, and so while we were friendly and so on, there weren't that, those, as I recall, we didn't do that much together. Mm -hmm. um, someone else is um, asking, they said that um, the film referenced the racial aspect of nine to five as being more complicated in Boston than in other regions uh, of the country. Um, that, can you talk any more about the racial aspects and the challenges um, in that regard in the nine to five movement? Sure. Well, I think the main thing that you see or you will see if you haven't watched the movie yet is that we were really nationally able to create a multiracial movement um, and uh, really have women of all backgrounds as leaders and eventually as staff people as well. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, 9 to 5 started in Boston at the same time the busing was going on. Um, we lived in a, still live in a very divided city, very segregated city. Um, I think that in my mind was also somewhat true in the office workforce in that um, a lot of white women were um, employed in companies downtown and not exclusively, but I know that a lot of uh, women of color were often employed in these kind of uh, very large data processing pools. They often tended to be outside the city of Boston. They had very long driveways going up to them. I remember trying to leaflet at them 
sometimes, and it was kind of impossible to catch any workers that way. But, uh, you know, whatever happened in Boston, I think that, um, you know, the movement overall, it was really reflective of the diversity of the workforce in various cities. You know, there were chapters in Baltimore, Atlanta that you saw in the movie, um, Cincinnati, Cleveland. Um, so I think that was where we ended up. Mm -hmm. um, Julia, uh, maybe you can uh, address this one. Uh, can you hear me okay? Maybe she can't. An audience member wants to know um, what I think was one of the more um, underappreciated aspects of your fight. Uh, and I don't, I mean, any of you could answer that one. Uh, I'm sorry, I actually couldn't hear that. What was one of the more? Oh. Underappreciated. I don't know. Um, I think um, underappreciated aspects of nine to five, I think was their use of humor and their cleverness and their ability to really find a way to galvanize the thoughts and win the trust of all kinds of women, whether they, identify, whether they would say, I'm not a feminist, whether they would say, I'd never go on a picket line, my husband would let me, whatever, let me join this thing. The way they used humor, I mean, it actually reminds me, I, I rec you know, thinking about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, okay, who we just lost, who was a giant, and we owe so much to her. But if you think about it, she used a similar kind of tactic. Like nine to five people said, look, they make me sew up their pants, the boss. They make me wash the dentures. You know, they pinch my ass. And so anyone hearing that in the public would say, well, that's wrong. That can't be. Okay. And I'm not paid what the guy working right next to me is paid. Okay. Really obvious stuff, right? Funny, some of it. Ruth Bader Ginsburg would use the example of a man who was discriminated against. Like, you remember that example of the woman in the Air Force who wanted to get um, benefits for her husband? And it was undeniable if it's a man. You know what I mean? It was undeniable in that case that he should get the benefits. But they, she had to use oftentimes how men were discriminated against to win the point that women shouldn't be treated like that. So she used some of the like really kind of obvious examples. I don't know if Karen and uh, Janet would agree with that, but when I saw the film about RGB, which I saw three times, uh, which is so wonderful, um, that occurred to me. You bet. I don't know. I didn't feel that nine to five was unappreciated. Actually, um, the Boston Globe itself covered nine to five. Often. Good. Well, the, but there were there any specific? And Ellen Goodman used to write columns about it. So uh, we got a, we got. I, I think the way we organized got a tremendous amount of notice in media. It was partly why it was so scary to employers because they thought from the beginning that we were going to unionize their workers. Um, so uh, I felt, I felt the love. <laughs> good, good. Well, I also, when you think of Ruth Bader Ginsburg standing in front of the uh, nine men of the Supreme Court, she kind of embarrassed them by being so direct and straightforward and with undeniable logic, which, you know, nine to five big time embarrassed the bosses. Big time made the public say, well, that's obvious. Right, and you see that, of course, in the movie, and it, and it's it's funny and it's undeniable. So they were using very smart tactics. I mean, they weren't doing what the union men were doing at that time, you know, shouting and marching around with picket signs at Atlantic Gate. You know, they were much more subversive, actually. One of the things you think you guys were subversive. One of the things I really appreciated about the movie was some of the archival footage you had, especially the interviews with men who were kind of on the peripheries of these protests. And the one guy saying, well, I don't know what they're complaining about. They get everything paid for. 
<laughs> it's just amazing that attitude yeah. just to be reminded that that used to be just that's what people thought it's just yeah yeah it was stunning um okay well we're almost out of time but um someone else uh, did want to ask um you janet and karen um about your biggest fears if you had any in starting the movement and and how you got the courage to kind of stand up to bosses and corporations and the patriarchy God, we didn't have enough sense to be afraid. And, <laughs> you know, and what do we have to lose? You know, we were riding this kind of really revolutionary wave and taking it right into the workplace. And uh, it just all seemed uh, natural. It was hard. Sometimes we thought we were going to lose the, you know, some big fight or the organization or, you know, we, we were making it up as we went along. But um, I don't think we were ever afraid of anything. Hmm. Janet? <laughs> and as you said, um, maybe not out of courage, but out of uh, just <laughs> blind determination. And you know, we had so many examples of, I, I often think about, there were so many wonderful women in this movement. And you know, it was sort of a, uh, our job and also a privilege to, um, help women come into leadership. And there were just so many cases of, of uh, women that had never done anything political before uh, finding their voice. And to be part of that was a thrill. So I would say um, we were inspiring, they were inspiring us, we were inspiring ourselves. And so we just did what we did. That's so great. Well, as a working woman, I would like to thank you guys for, uh, for what you did. And thank you, Julia, for, for making these amazing films about um, work and people and how important it is in our lives. Um, is there anything else that you guys would like to say before we uh, sign off? I just want to thank Julia for capturing what was uh, an important but forgotten part of our lives. And it's just such a treasure for us. Second that. It was a pleasure. It was a wonderful film to make. I loved making it. I loved meeting all of you guys all around. Finding you guys and meeting you and hanging out with you was just a wonderful experience. Okay. Hold it. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much for, for participating. Thank you to all the people that we can't see out there who are participating as well. Um, that's all we got. <laughs> thank you, Katie.